Well, hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the New Construction Marketing Podcast. I am your host, Anya Chrysanthan, and I'm very excited to introduce my guest for today, Bruce Alster. He is with GSF Mortgage Corporation, and he is part of their construction lending division. So Bruce, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you, Anya, and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to participate. Of course. Well, Bruce, we like to kick things off uh, typically by giving our listeners a little bit of a backstory on who you are and how did you get into this exciting world of new construction lending? I'd be glad to. First of all, I'm a Philadelphian much like yourself today. Uh, Although I live in Florida, just north of Sarasota, our company is GSF Mortgage or Go Mortgage is a national based lender. We specialize in construction lending. And I came to GSF about five years ago. I've been in the industry of of, uh, real estate finance for over 40 years. I know that's a long time. Um, My passion has been construction lending for the past 20 years. Um, GSF uh, provides us the opportunity uh, to be able to become a leading construction lender among the different types of lending options that I'm going to talk about later. Um, I came to the journey. I'm a graduate of University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, uh, business background, uh, and uh, just been active in the mortgage business for, for that long. Um, pretty much after uh, uh, I gr- actually went to law school, graduated law school, became a tax attorney for some time and found a real niche in the mortgage business and really had a passion for it. Construction lending is great because whether you're in an up cycle or a down cycle, if you're lending for construction, you're putting people to work and you're fulfilling a real pat a need, whether it be the first time home buyer or in some cases I've actually done multifamily uh, finance and so and large custom homes. So I've run the gamut and it's, it's just meeting the builders, meeting a satisfied borrower, meeting the people who work on the sites. It's just all very exciting and challenging. Yes, uh, both exciting and challenging. That definitely defines this industry. Um, so uh, Bruce, let's talk a little bit about mortgage um, trends. So over the last four months, it seems like mortgage rates have come down. Um, so they were in the fours and now back to threes. So can you talk a little bit about what's going on? You know, why, why are the mortgage rates going down? Because for so long, we've been threatening our buyers with increasing interest rates. And it seems that the rates were actually increasing for quite some time. And that was a great urgency to create to get people to make a decision. Uh, but now it seems that the, the trend is reversing. And so, right. you know, what's causing this reversal and where do you see interest rates um, going over the next couple of years or so? Well, it, it is a very interesting time. I think most of us in the lending industry are really uh, surprised um, by the quick drop in interest rates. Mm-hmm. Um, not that we are objecting. We, we enjoy the, the fact people want to refinance and that's become a larger part of everyone's uh, business. The why, if I knew the why, I, I'd, be, I'd get a Nobel Prize. But the, the answer is really, it's one of the purest uh, supply and demand markets there are. Uh, there, there is um, uh, a, a good supply of money, um, and the interest rates are dropping because the perception is inflation is low. Um, so you're not seeing, you're seeing right now the typical uh, Bell, bell mark, bell weather for uh, mortgage rates is the 10 year treasury for the 30 year equivalent for the 30 year mortgage rate. And that has dropped below one and a half percent consistently. And as we know, when we re- read in, in some places in Europe, there's negative interest rates. Um, and we're not going to explain what that all means, but in the United States, it means uh, people perceive inflation is going to be low. Um, and the economy is doing well. Um, There are people who who think that we need lower interest rates, and there are people who think um, we can't go any lower. So, but but right now, um, it's a great time to be a borrower. Um, 
it's a great time to lower your housing costs and it's a great time to buy a new home. Um, you get a lot more home for a lower payment or equivalent payment. Mm -hmm. um, so Bruce, I think there's definitely been a lot more talk about changing markets recently and we're seeing the trends, especially um, starting on the West Coast, um, that it's switching from really the, um, the seller's market to a buyer's market and, um, you know, watching the, um, uh, what is it, the million dollar New York. Uh, I don't know if you watched that show at all, uh, sure. but I mean, their whole thing is kind of the markets are going down, what's going on, you know, the complete reversal from previous season. So, and usually it kind of starts trickling down right from the West Coast, bigger cities, and then onward. So, and I think there's so much conflicting information right now because you do hear these trends of, uh, of real estate reversal, that we are in a shifting market, in fact, that um, you know, it, things are going to be changing, yet um, you know, we're pumped every single day with the news of um, new construction starts are up from previous year, and you know, the rates are going down, so all this great news kind of countering the, 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 the trend that we're seeing. So I'm just wondering if the whole lowering of real uh, of uh, interest rates is kind of like an artificial attempt of our government to stimulate the economy that is kind of like on its last um, TikTok, so to speak, before we hit that recession. So what are your thoughts on that? What are you hearing in the industry? Um, you know what when you're meeting with customers especially with the volatility in the real estate market um you know it's definitely a big concern for people i know i've talked to several financial advisors who are saying that they're seeing cash um flowing out of the stock market right now and people just stashing it into um, money market reserves to kind of park it and uh, wait for a more opportune time to get back into into the market so what are you seeing well, there, there's a lot of questions there and some great observations. On the, the, the first and most important is the facts. And the facts are that the housing inventory in this country is well below where it needs to be to fulfill the housing demand. Um, and whether it's at the early entry point, the affordable housing sector, um, and, uh, or, or the, the larger homes. I, so I, I think we have a need to we could be building, I, I, I've seen a statistic, somewhere around the neighborhood of 3 million homes um, could be added to the inventory over the next five years. And that, it, to just catch up to the need, uh, a balance in the, in the housing market. And that's why you're seeing new housing um, starts and permits continue to uh, lead, be a leading indicator. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other is, what you mentioned is the million dollar homes. So that just points to the fact that housing is a very localized business. And, and I see it in our market here in Florida. It, the higher priced homes are on the market longer. Um, there's more price cutting when it comes to either selling the new home or um, uh, people, there's not bidding wars now in, in our particular market. Um, the, and, and, but it's going to vary from market to market. Um, I think at the... Uh, Entry level up to four or five hundred thousand. There's still very competitive bidding going on for homes, whether it be new construction or existing home sales, uh, for if homes are somewhat priced right. Um, so, so again, it's a very localized market. I think in the construction world, we've seen changes in who who is making construction loans uh, uh, as as the pendulum has swung historically from the small local banks to the larger big banks uh, into the uh, non-depository lenders like mortgage bankers, known as IMBs, independent mortgage bankers. So we're seeing a lot of people offering construction lending, which basically tells you there's a need out there and people like to be served from a variety of, of places. Um, I, I mean, I, I can't predict where it's, it, you know, what the global macro economy is going to do uh, politically or um, 
I don't believe that the government is artificially doing anything right now. I think it's a very large supply and demand market. And as long as the perception of inflation is low, we're going to see uh, interest rates um, and the economy is doing well. I think um, there's room to continue to stimulate. One of the tools has always been lower interest rates. Mm -hmm. uh, so the Fed lower the rate. There are people who think uh, the interbank rate, we think people um, will continue to lower rates even further this year. Um, and if that's the case, it, it now is starting to trickle down to the consumer. It didn't initially, and that was a disconnect. Um, so that was one observation I did make, um, that we didn't see a necessarily lockstep movement between the 10-year treasury and consumer mortgage rates. But now it's starting to catch up um, for, for a variety of reasons, mechanical and uh, rational reasons in the, in the secondary, what's called the secondary mortgage market. But, but I believe uh, it's gonna, the housing market is gonna continue to add inventory um, in, in, the, in the coming years. I think builders are gonna have a, a, a great run here. Mm -hmm. And I think how they use their capital um, is, is something that now we, can, you know, we get into construction lending and how that can help support the builders building more inventory. And, and the government is supporting that effort in, in a variety of ways through uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, um, and uh, the other agencies. Yes, yeah, so so many great points there. I um, I completely agree with you on kind of like the uh, the localized markets. And I was just looking at um, my market in my area as I'm getting ready to release my quarterly market update to my customers. And the inventory, it's so crazy because last year we were at a low low inventory. Um, you know, we were about like three months supply. And this year, we're actually 20% lower than last year. It's so, hard to believe it. Three months getting lower, right? Right. So, and then if you think about real estate, six months is kind of like gives you that equilibrium. So anything below six months is considered the seller's market. Over six months, you're going into the buyer's market. So, and yeah, you're right. Uh, when people ask me about the real estate market in my area, it's really is the tail of two markets right now. Um, as you mentioned, anything up to 500 is still very active and you are seeing multiple offers. Things are moving pretty quickly um, in that lower market. So the, you know, the first time home buyer, um, lower price point, and then anything over, let's say like 600 um, up, you are seeing more of a, um, you know, increased days on the market, um, definitely price reductions. So, so it is, it is interesting. So it goes back to the whole affordability factor. And obviously with new construction, I think it is very challenging to make new homes affordable, right? Because of the cost of the land, we have all the regulations that the builders have to comply with, uh, which, you know, are very restricting and, um, you know, cost and effective in many ways. Um, plus with, um, you know, just the, the tariffs as well. I was talking mm -hmm. to local builders and they're all saying, hey, I had to buy, you know, X amount of dishwashers and appliances basically stock up yeah. for the whole year. So it's all predetermined. So there's no picking because, you know, the, if I didn't do it, then my price would have been 30% higher. And same thing with the cost of lumber, you know, over the last year, it's increased about 30%. So these prices are increasing for the builders, yet they are unable to pass that price increase onto the consumer because the consumer is already struggling with um, being able to afford buying um, right. homes, especially newer homes that are more expensive traditionally than resale. So... Right. Um, let me, let me comment, if I can, Anya, let me comment on one thing you mentioned that's very important to, for, I think, your listeners to understand as they go through this market. It, it has to get more efficient. Our, our whole world is becoming much more efficient for reasons. Um, in the building industry, has historically um, had uh, the luxury of, of time and the luxury of labor uh, surpluses in the past. And, um, and, uh, and, and been able to pass on the price of, um, of increased costs to their consumers. 
That is not the case anymore, even in this uh, inventory short market. They have to build faster, build more efficiently, and um, be able to use um, uh, and, and, and account for the fact that there is a labor shortage and it's hard to get people uh, to do certain trades on the site and it takes longer to build. The longer it takes to build, time is money, whether they're incurring the cost or their borrower or, or their customer buyer is incurring the cost. So all those factors uh, are leading us to a, a better, more efficient market, which is great. It's also one of the reasons that, and I just come off uh, about two weeks of travel, where, and I know this ne may not necessarily be your market, uh, Anya, but around the country, there's a lot of affordable housing being built off-site inside mm -hmm. some of the major uh, manufacturers of homes. And if you go through those homes, whether they be 1,300 square feet or 2,500 square feet, whether they be rural in, on five acre lots or they be inner city on a couple vacant lots, um, these are beautiful homes and they're built in less, and I'm convinced that it is in large part the wave of the future for the entry level home. Mm -hmm. and, um, and because it's built quicker, it's built more efficiently and the quality is uh, and lower cost and the quality is less. Uh, it is, I'm sorry, the quality is more uh, than the standard manufactured home and it equates to um, a stick built home. Um, so those, those two roads are gonna cross, especially at the affordability sector. And I think we're gonna see more in the country. One of the hurdles, just so everyone is aware of that expansion is the house, is the zoning rules, allowing a offsite home be delivered to a site in a community. But uh, it's just a trend, you asked about trends, and that, mm -hmm. that's coming. Um, it's, it's coming and the agencies, Fannie and Freddie, and uh, recognize it and they're supporting it with their, um, by encouraging lower cost financing for those homes that has traditionally been available. And we're a big supporter of that. I think the industry as a whole, the lending industry, is a big supporter of that type of uh, program. Yeah, I'm actually seeing that in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, recently, I had a chance to interview two developers, and um, they are the first, they built first, um, like, manufactured homes right in the city, which is crazy, because yeah. if you think about the type of homes that they're building, they're multifamily, so they're right. high, you know, not, I don't say high rise, but they're multi, multi-story Mm -hmm. And obviously, there's only so much that you can build as far as the height and, and whatnot. But um, yeah, they were talking about the efficiency and um, all the benefits of that. Right. So if we're seeing it in Philadelphia, I'm sure we're going to see it in a lot uh, more other exactly. cities as well. So it's, uh, it's a promising trend for sure. Yeah. And um, I'd like to touch on one other uh, point that you brought up is the rise of the uh, brokerages offering new construction financing. So mm -hmm. it seems like it, it's definitely, you know, uh, when you look at lending as a whole, what we went through from the whole uh, financial crisis um, to now, and you know how for a while you couldn't get financing um, where before mm -hmm. it was like, no job, no problem, here's, here's a loan. Um, to, you know, we went to kind of like the complete opposite side where you had to basically, you know, give away your first born child to <laughs> secure financing to now things are starting to loosen up again. And I am starting to see like 0% down financing available, um, a lot looser rules around credit scores, etc. And also <laughs> the rise of, um, again, brokers so basically the smaller guys who are able to shop several different institutions to provide lending um, right. so is that um, do you see it as a good thing or um, is it a concern um, because um, you know certainly we don't want to go back to what caused the financial crisis in the first place and kind of like complete um, you know, deregulation of mortgages? Well, the, let's talk about it in the sense of non-construction first, then let me talk about it in the context of our, our topic of construction lending. In the non-construction world, there are a lot of disruptive entries into the business. 
known as fintechs, a uh, large uh, technology-based um, lending. Um, we, you know, Quicken is a great example of a company that, that you know, I, I want to say, I'm, I may, math may be wrong, but 10, 12 years ago, um, was a small, much smaller company. And today, it dominates the non-depository market for lending. And they are, it, compared to the large depositories like Wells and Chase they, and City, they are larger or, I, I'm not sure of the league tables, but they're large. I mean, they're in the top three or five or whatever of origination. So obviously their model works, they are able to attract business. Um, but there are people who like to, do, and, and, and you will find in our industry that anyone looking for a mortgage today, just like for real estate, they shop online first. Um, and they and they they chase rate, they chase um, everything. But they always, or seventy percent of them, will always want someone local. Is what I understand the statistics to be. So you're still dealing with a belly to belly sale for the most important transaction of your life um, mm -hmm. is your real estate loan. So it, it, so you still have people who prefer that, but they are certainly getting more comfortable with the. Uh, consumer direct um, model done online. Um, there, there's mobile notaries to close around the country. There's um, all the documents can be done from your, your mobile phone, your, your smartphone now. Um, it's, it's very common and it's like I said before when it came to building. In lending, it has to move in the same direction because the cost of manufacturing a loan is gone up. It's a people cost, it's a technology cost. So you have to use uh, more technology to leverage your tools in your business. So that's on the non-CP side. And that trend is going to continue. It's going to get better. It's going to get faster. The broker is, is the epitome of the belly-to-belly -belly sale, being able to shop around for you and get to meet them, sit in their office. They come to you. And, uh, and we all thought brokers were going away after the credit crisis uh, because they were you know, the bad guys. But in fact, they, they are, they, it, a professional broker serves a real purpose and really can shop around and, uh, and they earn their money. Um, and uh, it's much different. It's generally more efficient than going to a bank and sp spending a long time in the bank, a bank bureaucracy. Um, so, so the broker world is not going away anytime soon. Um, and I think um, there's, there, there will still continue to be consolidation because of the cost of doing business and the regulation among larger and larger mortgage companies, but they may be buying from the broker as originating themselves down, down the road. Um, there's, there's still room for a lot of people in this industry um, to, to serve a consumer. The, um, as construction lending is not disruptable at the front end, at the primary market by fintech. You don't see Quicken Loans offering a robust construction loan product. So Why is that? It, because they're not, uh, it's, it's, a, it's got a lot more moving parts and a, a lot different process and procedures. So operational costs, which I've mentioned are already high, go actually much higher. And it's, it's disruptive to an entire mortgage company's organization. Um, so, so that, but it's still, um, it still, the providers of the product, because of the demand, are starting to fill more, uh, more supply. Um, one of the, um, so, but, so let's establish a fact that construction lending is not a fintech type product. Mm -hmm. uh, what it is and what it is becoming is that the traditional player, your local savings and loan or your local credit union, or even a regional bank, um, who you would just go to and sit down with and say, I want to build a house. Um, you'll find builders, if you're going to Lennar or Toll or Pulte or one of the big builders, they have their own mortgage companies. They incent you um, to use their mortgage company. Um, and uh, in fact, I, I, I shop a lot um, just to look at competition. And, and I was at one of the large ones this two weekends ago, and they insisted if you're going to buy a home that you actually have to fill out an application with their mortgage company. Mm -hmm. and I understand they want to know who you are before, but they're going to build the house with their own money. They don't need your construction money. And it's, it's, even if you walk in and say, I'll supply it, what can I get off the house? They won't, they generally will not do that. Uh, 
but that's um, not every every builder. We have, as we talked previously, you you attended the National Association of Home Builders Convention, and uh, and congratulations on your award, by the way. Thank you for that uh, for your podcast. It, uh, it's getting notoriety. Um, we um, we saw that the majority of builders in this country build less than 300 homes a year, and that's and those builders need and can benefit from in the transaction of building a home with a consumer for a consumer, uh, they can benefit from the borrower bringing their own construction lending, whether they bring it just for the construction part or they do it, and we'll talk about a one-time close transaction where they close once on the construction loan when construction's completed, it becomes the permanent loan, it modifies into the permanent loan. So, so uh, Basically, to go to your question, we, we have a, two, a, a tale of two markets when it comes to lending. One is the construction market that is not disrupted by fintech and the, and the trends in, in non-construction or regular lending don't necessarily translate into the construction world. Right. All right. So I think not yet disrupted, right? Just like I, I'm thinking about Zillow and um, I think Zillow is now offering lending as well. Right. And obviously, Zillow has gone into new construction. So I wonder if uh, Zillow new construction lending is coming next, right? I wouldn't be surprised well, with them. Do you think, um, and I, you would be able to maybe answer this better than me, I haven't seen them in the market as a construction lender. Um, not yet. I, I have not seen that at yeah. all. So and I think future if, they do, if they do, they need someone to support <laughs> that effort. And uh, I, don't, I don't doubt that they're looking at it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then what you said you do shop your competition. And then as far as like the larger builders, I, I know the uh, national builder that I used to work for, they offered their own in-house financing. Yeah. And typically you maybe were not required to use them. You did right. have to apply, um, right. but typically there was a, um, some type of an incentive tied into it where they would either give you money towards closing costs or money towards options if you do use them. So what's your take on that? Um, you know, if you shop the rates, um, are they generally competitive? Um, you know, what would you recommend to a consumer buying a new construction from a large national builder? Should they use their um, finance company for the you know, ease of transaction or stay away? You know, big warning. Well, the the, my my view is my my philosophy is there's no such thing as a free lunch. So what what I mean by that is when when I walk I, look I walk into a builder and I, I, I'm certainly a more educated finance you know finance guy. So I walk in and I uh, and they tell me well I'm going to give you money off your upgrades. I'm going to give you 2,500 towards your upgrades. But I believe they're making it someplace else and and whether they lower your rate. Uh, or the perception of they lower your rate, you're paying for it someplace else in the house. It's, there's no free lunch here. I, I, that's my, my true belief. I mean, we all, at the end of the day, we all, uh, all the loans are priced into a, a very uh, competitive secondary market where your loan, um, and we didn't, we didn't really talk about bank portfolio loans, but a standard 30 year permanent loan, they're all going into a secondary market that we all compete in. And, and it's a relatively level playing field, whether I sell your loan there or they sell your loan there. How they dress it up and give it to you um, by offering incentives on one hand and taking them away in a place you don't even know about. So they perceive your rates lower, but they're getting more for the house than you might otherwise pay. Um, it, it's, it's just marketing. It's, it's literally marketing. So to answer your question, should I, uh, you know, if you want to buy from a big builder, they don't need your construction money. They're going to, they're going to do a great job. They build great homes. Um, uh, they, um, uh, for the larger builders who are building, they tend because of the cost of building to build more higher end homes, um, in the four, what I'll call higher end 400, 500 higher. Um, in which case they are um, uh, going to be um, probably your lender of choice in many cases. Um, in, in our world, um, where you're dealing with a builder who builds two or 
300 homes a year, whether they build them on your lot, where they build them on their lot, they are, um, they can, they, they don't have to build in an interest cost and they don't have, and they don't have to um, um, build the financing costs of whether holding the land or holding the, the uh, borrowing costs while they construct the home if you use your own money. And that tends to work out to be a lower price for you. Um, the builder should be happier. He's up to five or ten percent, or maybe fifteen percent down payment, and hope that you qualify for a loan when the house is done. That risk is taken away from a builder like that, um, and and that's where uh, lending a different kind of lending can come in from a from an independent mortgage banker. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if I were to review the landscape today, instead of just going to your credit union or your savings and loan or what you thrift, um, you, or, or uh, if you're looking at a home where you're gonna borrow under the Fannie Mae limit of 484,000 some odd dollars in most communities, including uh, near Pennsylvania, where you are, um, you're, you're gonna be, um, you, you're gonna be better off if you can go and, and a better, uh, consumer transaction faster, more efficient, if you go through uh, an independent mortgage banker than a local bank. Uh, that's my experience. If you're gonna go to the jumbo route where you're building a million and a half dollar home, you want your relationship to be with your Merrill Lynch broker or Bank of America or, or Wells Fargo or City or a regional bank like Regions or bb and or whatever. Um, they want your deposits, they want, they, they are able to uh, or give you a portfolio product as opposed to a 30 year and um, they'll be more competitive in that space. Interesting. As a general rule. Okay. So let's transition a little bit and talk about the, I guess, the nuances of new construction lending versus traditional and some of the pitfalls that you see, um, you know, maybe some of the specialty products that um, most um, lenders in that area will offer so that we can uh, be educated on this topic when we're talking to our customers. So, you know, what are some of the must-haves with new construction lending and what are some of the pitfalls to avoid? Uh, good question. So, if I'm looking for to build a home, uh, the first thing is, I, I, if I if, again, if you're looking at um, a non-custom home, but a, you know, a nice home all the way down to entry level. My first thing is cost. You know, what's it going to cost? And, and if I can, uh, in some communities, some states, the, if you do one loan as opposed to two loans, so you do a construction loan, what we call single close, into a permanent loan, the construction and the permanent, you're going to save the cost of having a second closing. And you only apply once for that loan. And in certain circumstances, uh, the agency rules uh, don't require you to re, if you can fit into this transaction, uh, which most people can, um, they're looking to uh, buy a home and build a home. Um, you can, um, you only have one, one closing and you have uh, construction, uh, you can have, um, you don't have the second cost and you only have to apply once, and you don't have to have your credit refreshed at the time you modify the loan. You don't have to re-qualify. Mm -hmm. And you know what your monthly payment's going to be the moment you close on the house, on the land. You already own the land. It can be used as equity in that transaction. And it, it, in most cases, I can't think of many where you wouldn't. You'd be better off with that type of loan if you're building your home. Um, in uh, a situation where you're going into an entry level home, um, same thing. Um, you can use that uh, construction loan to turn it uh, into your permanent loan. Um, if, uh, if I were talking to a builder today, I would say, do you, um, the builder, are you vetted, uh, is the builder has to be vetted by the lender to be eligible to build the home uh, under that type of lending program. Mm -hmm. um, vetted with many banks or, or uh, local mortgage companies. And if they're not, um, you could do your shopping online before you even walk in and say, I'd like you to you know, get vetted with one or two of these. And then we, in our case, we would look at them. We don't ask for much information. 
and we work to their schedule on the draws. Um, so they can uh, you know, be paid as the house is built. We, we show them the benefits of, of, of borrowing um, where they, they don't have to worry about the credit refresh or failing to qualify at the end. All they have to do is build a home. Um, so that's, that's the big advantage of, of a single close. Uh, if you go to a two-time close and a custom, you, you generally end up with a longer build period. You may have to put your own money into the transaction at a, at a, along the way, um, depending on changing things in the house. As, you, as a salesperson, always notice, you know, saw people change things after the house was already starting construction, which makes it, definitely makes it more expensive. Get all your questions, an as you would tell someone, get all your questions answered up front get all your, uh, de define all your needs up front and be prepared to have that house built for you. Don't try and change it along the way. It only becomes longer and more expensive. So that would be one of the pitfalls to avoid. Um, uh, you know, be, be real careful when you're dealing with a lender that they've done construction lending before and they know and understand the product. And it's, and, and it's not, and it may be something they do on a regular basis and they're very familiar with. Uh, experience matters a lot uh, in that type of lending. Um, it's not a plain vanilla loan. Um, so vet your builder, uh, vet your lender, um, do some research online uh, about who offers construction lending in your area. And, um, and uh, that, that would be my a big suggestion. Okay. Yeah. So definitely experience matters. And yeah. then as far as locking interest rates go, um, obviously one of the advantages of uh, construction loans or um, new construction specific loans is that you do have an ability to lock in uh, for a for, um, longer period of time versus a resale. So what would you typically recommend that consumer look for as far as uh, what that time frame should be and you know um, how many flow down options um, should be available, if you can explain that a little bit as well. Right, thanks for, for bringing that up. And that ties directly into the, your view on interest rates. Are they going down or are they going up? Um, in, in this market with such low interest rates, my first question to my lender on a construction loan would be, what's my payment going to be when the house is done? What's my monthly payment? And that requires you to lock the interest rate before the house starts being built. Mm -hmm. um, and there are such options are out there where you want to know what that is. Very, uh, you will find lenders who will walk in and say, yes, I'll do the construction loan, but, oh, if you want to lock that rate, well, that rate's going to be higher um, than what I'm quoting you up front. And that's because you have to pay for that extended lock period involved in the loan, which is fine, it, but it's still going to, shouldn't be higher than three-eighths to a half a point over current rate. So if the house were there today and you were ready to buy it and the rate you could qualify for was 375, if you're much above four, like to four and an eighth for your construction loan that you'll be guaranteed the permanent rate, you know, six, nine months from now, that's where you should be. Uh, if you see it higher than that, you're, you're possibly with the wrong lender. That now, still sounds okay. like a big, um, big difference. I mean, half it, a percent. It, it's... Look at the monthly payment. It's not that big. And remember, you're, you're tying up, you're, you're taking the risk out of the, uh, what it, so it leads to the second option of float down. If you don't want to, if you want the option of knowing that that's the highest rate you could possibly have, which at four and an eighth versus a 375 market is not bad um, today for you know, a newly built home that's not gonna be delivered for this extended period. Because um, if you were to pay, you, you have the, 75, but you're going to pay a point up front, somewhere around there. And if I'm going to pay a point up front, yeah, we'll guarantee the 375. But if you don't want to pay the point up front and you just want to maximize your loan to value, that, and that was a good question, you, you're going to be at around four and eight in that area. Um, the, the other is the float down. So if I want the benefit of heads I win, tails you lose program, that's the float down. I pay you a quarter to three eighths up front in points or a float down fee. Um, and that, that rate, uh, that will then guarantee you that that four and an eighth will never be higher. But if the rate is lower, the index is lower at the time you modify the loan, you'll get the lower rate. 
and we offer we offer such a product. Several other lenders offer such a product, um, and you but you pay for it. You pay you know that quarter of three eighths. So a float down option is is a protection of lowering interest rates at the same time providing a lock. Um, if you were to walk into a bank uh, and say the builder was building the house today, um, and um, you 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 knew it was going to be ready in seven or eight months. And you walked into your local bank and say, I want my permanent loan rate today, um, but I'm not going to move in for eight months. They're going to charge you for that option, for that extended lock, and anywhere from a half to one full point, depending on the length of time and the, uh, and the size of the loan. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you'll, you'll find that. Um, I, I, if you're doing the all-in-one loan, the single close, you, 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 know, you want to look to either pay for the extended lock up front and get the lower rate or get the float down. So what are you recommending to people right now? Obviously the rates have come down. Do right. I, I tell pay? people, I, if I tell people the best deal out there to me is it is lock in your, your permanent loan rate today, okay. pay the point up front. You're building a new house. Most people building a 400, $500,000 house. It's generally their second home. They've had additional savings or a different place in their income cycle or gain, you know in their in their life in their careers and you you can save on a four, by putting four thousand dollars down you can lock in that low rate today for in the future and i encourage people to do that um don't uh there there are other options of building it into the loan i don't i don't encourage not many lenders do that and it gets confusing uh i would i would go uh i would say two things one do that type of transaction I think you get the most bang for your buck. And secondly, don't worry about the construction period interest rate. Um, there's two, generally two options with it, depending on what type of loan you get. During that construction period, people worry about, well, I'm gonna be making two payments. If, it's, um, if they can afford it and it's, it fits their budget, they should. You know, they, make, they only pay for what's been dispersed on the loan. But mm -hmm. the difference in rate from a bank versus an, an independent mortgage banker may be, uh, two two percent in in difference in rate. At, do the math. It may be five hundred dollars over the life of building the home, or six hundred dollars over the life of building the home. It's not a lot of money mm -hmm. um, it, um, in that rate differential. If you're doing a government loan like an FHA, which goes to ninety six and a half percent, or a VA one hundred percent for our veterans, um, you can actually roll that interest into the loan itself. So instead of borrowing four hundred thousand, you borrow four hundred and twelve thousand five hundred dollars, and you never make an interest payment during construction at all. Mm -hmm. um, so you talk to your lender. You have options for construction interest during the uh, how you handle construction interest during construction, and uh, uh, I would encourage you to talk to your lender. Um, but I like that one percent down. Give me the lowest rate I can get today, and move on. All right, makes sense. And um, lastly, to wrap things up, um, you know, what is your take on the future of uh, Fannie and Freddie? Um, you know, obviously they have repaid their debt, so to speak, to <laughs> to our to U.S. government. Um, there's a lot of talk about them going, um, you know, on their own, or uh, people are talking about splitting them up into several different entities. Um, so what do you see happening with that? Yeah, I, I, you know, you, what you said is true. They, they're, a, they're a money machine for the federal government now, and that, that's served it well. Um, uh, and then more recently, of course, we've heard that the government has an initiative to, to uh, set them on their way and, uh, and let the, them take more risk than the, the federal government. And you've heard more drumbeat around that. Um, it, it doesn't seem to be at the top of the list of things happening today, uh, but I'm not that, I, I don't want to say I'm that close to it. I only read the headlines and, uh, for some of that. Uh, they have merged some of their securitization, which is a step in that direction. So people, people think that uh, having a common security platform, uh, which, which is more technical, uh, is going to make it uh, easier for them to either uh, merge or one of them go away. I mean, I, I believe they're in in the near term. We're gonna we're gonna see a separate Fannie and Freddie, um, and uh, I think they're they're 
the one thing that's happened even now that they're they're not out of conservatorship, but one thing that's happened is they're becoming a lot more market sensitive and driven towards affordable housing and less risk taking. And I think that is a good thing for the economy. It's uh, going to keep us safer in supplying capital to to the housing market. And uh, that's that's my overall view. Great. Well, thank you so much, Bruce. It's been such a pleasure thank to you. have you on. You brought such a great insight into this, um, you know, uh, crazy world of uh, new construction lending. Uh, there's certainly so many different nuances and um, um, it's ever changing. So if somebody wanted to reach out to you with any questions or maybe um, their company is able to offer um, you know, a third party financing. Um, how would they reach out to you? What's the best way to get in touch with you? Well, the easiest way is through uh, email. Um, and I would be glad to, do you want me to just tell you what the email is? Uh, what I can do is I can link that in the show notes, you guys. So um, I will, I'll, I'll provide that information. But if you do want to go ahead and give us your email address for those listening. It's B as in boy. O-L-S-T-E-R at go, G-O, G-S-F dot com. Okay, perfect. Um, and I will also provide links to your LinkedIn profile. So if you guys want to check out um, Bruce online, uh, take a look at that. And um, again, I thank you so very much for being a guest today. I appreciate your time and I hope we'll get to see each other in the uh, your future, hopefully we'll get to party with those crazy um, Florida builders. <laughs> Absolutely, they're a good group. They are a good group, so. Thank you for allowing me to participate. Thank you, Bruce, talk to you soon. Bye.